Hello and welcome to The Thing About Golf, the podcast series from Golf Australia magazine that explores the many and varied reasons that people get hooked on this ridiculous game. My name's Rod Murray and I'm your host on this journey into the minds and motivations of those who love the game, from world-class pros to lifelong duffers and every level of player, administrator and entrepreneur in between. Now, since the last time we spoke, it'd be fair to say that things have changed a bit in the world, and most certainly that's true in golf. When we sat down to chat with John Paramore at the Vic Open in February, I don't think anybody could have predicted that just six weeks later, the world would all but be in lockdown. The same is true for our next couple of interviews, including today's chat with English golfer Megan McLaren. More on Megan in just a moment, but first, some housekeeping. Now, under the current circumstances, with so many of us in self-isolation, thanks to COVID-19, I'm sure that many of you, like me, are looking for ways to stay entertained and engaged. Podcasts are a fantastic way to do that. And with all the humility I can muster, might I suggest that if you haven't already done so, a trip to the Thing About Golf archives could be just the tonic. Since we launched the show a little less than a year ago, we've been lucky enough to snare some fabulous guests, including Peter Lonard and Peter Senior, Bamboogle Dunes owner Richard Sattler, and the dynamic duo of Australian golf couples, Bob and Kathy Shearer. You can find those episodes and all of the rest at the Golf Australia website under the podcast tab. I'll put a link in the show notes. Or by doing the best thing of all and simply subscribing to the show on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or any of the other myriad of podcast apps that are out there in the marketplace. If you do like the show, you could do us a favour by sharing it with somebody you think might also be interested. The thing about golf family is growing, and we'd love to see that continue to be the case. And as we all know, there's no better advertising than a word of mouth. So please do tell a friend. And just before we come to Meg, it's been a terrific to get lots of feedback and suggestions from listeners all over the world about potential guests and topics. And yes, I do read them all. And some of those suggestions are or are already in the pipeline. But if there's somebody you'd particularly like to hear on the show, don't hesitate to let us know. You can contact me directly on Twitter at at Rod underscore Mori. That's M for Mary O-R-R-I. My private messages there are open, so anybody can get in touch. You can email us at golf at golfaustralia.com.au or head to Facebook and look up Golf Australia magazine. Also, make sure to follow along on Twitter, where the show has its own handle at at Thing Golf. That's capital T-H-I-N-G, capital G. OLF. Okay, on with today's show. And this is one that I've really been looking forward to for quite some time. Many of you will know Meg McLaren as a two time New South Wales Open winner, as well as for her excellent blog. But to many in the golf world, Meg, unfairly as we'll find out, is simply known as that equal pay girl. With one simple tweet last year, McLaren almost broke the internet. And while gender inequality is an occasional theme in her writing, it is far from the dominant topic. So why? all the attention. That's just one of the things we'll explore, though I hope it doesn't dominate as it has in many other areas of Meg's public life. Because Meg is not only an elite golfer, she's charming, engaging and articulate and has a keen sense of humour about herself and the game more broadly. I sat down with Meg at the Australian Ladies Classic Tournament at Bonville last month for a chat that I hope you enjoy at least half as much as I did. Well, Meg McLaren, the first thing we've got to say is thank you for taking some time. These in-depth things aren't always easy to find time for, so we appreciate you doing that. The jumping-off point for this podcast is to complete this sentence. The thing about golf is... I've been trying to answer that for the last 15 years, I think. (laughs) It's addictive for me. Mm -hmm. What about it? What's addictive? It's. I read something today, and it's something that's been on my mind the last probably week it's it's problem solving you know everything about golf is trying to solve a problem you've never ever got it apart from these like fleeting moments mm-hmm. when you're out on the course and you might hit a shot that's exactly as you see it or you might have four or five holes where everything just goes the way that you want it to but then you spend the rest of your career <laughs> trying to get into those moments and the more you try the, the harder it gets it's one giant conundrum isn't it are you sort of saying in a roundabout way it's a journey not a destination golf yeah of course but i suppose every sport every yeah. every path is um but it reminds you of that on a daily basis yeah. how many did hogan claim he'd hit in his very best rounds maybe four or five where he was looking exactly and people have this perception that golf 
especially professional golf at the highest level is it's just good shot after good shot after good shot but it's so rare to actually hit a shot or a putt or a chip exactly as you see it Mm. we'll come to it's a game of misses and all that in a moment what role has television played in that do you think i think a much bigger one than people appreciate because you're watching the guys at the top all the time you're watching the guys at the top of the leaderboard if you want to see what a grind golf actually is even at that level go out and watch the players who are teeing off in the morning on a Saturday or the guys on a Friday afternoon who are trying to make a cut like it's there's a lot of very average stuff that goes on but sort of being able to turn that into scores that's actually what the essence of golf is I think Mm -hmm. we see it at the Vic Open people getting up close to the players that no ropes thing does something really important I think for golf fans which we miss out on I I wish that golf's motto was there's nothing like live golf which is what you've just described (laughs) isn't it I think so yeah because I think like so I'm a big football fan as well a soccer Mm -hmm. fan and week in week out you go and watch these matches I'm a Newcastle fan so any English people will understand that no it's well, I love it, but is it's, it like being a St Kilda fan here in Australia? Is I have it the same no idea. St Kilda, they never win. They yeah, it, just but a slide. those moments uh-huh. when they happen are unbelievable, uh-huh. and that's a bit like what golf is. You know, you you just have to endure through the stuff mm. that's not that great because the moments when they come that are you know they're the ones that are worth practicing for. They're the ones that are worth watching as a fan. Whenever you sort of understand a little bit about what somebody's been through to get to those moments. I think that's what makes it special. As a spectator, it's cruel, but the bad shots are sometimes (laughs) the most fun when you see the pros hit bad shots. Yeah, definitely. It's it's like watching the the car racing for an accident. It's not quite that bad. (laughs) but And I feel like if more people went to watch the golf, they'd feel better about their own golf. Because golf at the very top level is not what you see on television. No, exactly. And you, especially amateur golfers, I think, They'll have wedges in their hands or they'll be 100 yards out and you expect to hit it to within 10 foot. And if you don't, then you're, you're angry at yourself. And yet if you look at the stats for how often professional golfers do that, it's not that often. So you kind of, there's this built-in notion that, that you're supposed to be this good or the expectation levels are up here. But it's not like that for the majority of the time. What does expectation do to golf? It can ruin golfers, can ruin very good golfers. Um, I don't know, it's a fine line between having the confidence that, you know, of what you're capable of and what you know you could be doing out there. But as soon as you start thinking, I should be doing this or I should be doing that, then you're you're building a bit of a hole for yourself or digging a hole for yourself. Um, You hear so often players who win tournaments or who have really low rounds talk about how they weren't expecting it or it came whenever they just let go of whatever they were trying to do and just went to see see what would happen and there's definitely something in that that people don't think about too much Mm. I think all of us have had on the putting green that experience haven't we when you're just chatting to a mate and casually rolling balls you'll not you'll hold four in a row from 15 feet when you're not thinking about as soon as you line (laughs) up the line and crouch down and do the thing with the putter you start missing them yes well (laughs) I saw, well, let's talk about that. So golf being a game of misses, tease that out for those who maybe don't understand that. I guess Peter Senior once told me, I've never forgotten this, that all good players can shoot 63. The best players turn their 75s into 72 or 71 or maybe 70. So yeah. maybe tease that notion out a bit. I think that's, that's such a massive part of golf or golf at the highest level and at uh, the difference between good amateurs and money-making professionals is you've got to find a way, whether it's through good short game, good putting, or through just being smart to shoot 70 or 72 when your game, you know, on another day could be an 80. Um, it's, I think it's a bit to do with, with technique because the better you are technically, the less can go wrong sort of, drastically Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean if you can keep double bogeys off your card or keep the out of bounds shot off your card then you're going to be able to keep that score down Um, but you're right you'll see a player who wins a tournament will probably have a round of 72 or something like that over the course of the four rounds and they won't have played very well quite quite probably 
Like you can't play really good golf for four rounds in a row. You just can't do it. It so, is almost unheard of, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's actually, I think Patrick Reed might have done it five years ago. Okay. For three rounds of 63 and maybe a 65 or something <laughs> in the desert somewhere. It was yeah. like, wow, this is amazing. That's the thing. You'll, you'll rarely see, I might be wrong, but you'll rarely see four rounds in the 60s from a winner, which just shows there'll be stuff in there that you've just got to deal with as it happens. Do you have to keep learning these lessons? You're a golf professional. You've been at it for a while. <laughs> I think it was Bobby Jones that said, we just keep learning the same lessons over and over and over. Yeah, isn't that the truth? It, um, yeah, you know, especially when you come to a course that you've been to before, you might suddenly remember something and you're like, God, and like, I, I write down quite a lot of stuff. And sometimes I'll write something down and I'll be like, that, lo- that looks familiar. And I'll, <laughs> I'll go back and a year ago I've written exactly the, the same, same thing. thing. And it's just the nature of golf. There's so many elements to mm-hmm. it that you can't remember everything. And if you did, you'd probably drive yourself insane anyway. And David, if you don't, you're going to drive yourself insane. So just <laughs> accept it, Meg. The, the, ultimate, the ultimate finish is that we all end up insane. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> we have to be insane to start and you insane will, to carry on, I reckon. You, do you kind of, on a serious note? You've got to be a little bit bonkers, don't you, to do what you're doing? What are you, 25? You travel around the world? <laughs> There's weeks you go, you don't get paid. Money must be a constant concern, I'm assuming. I mean, we're not to pry into that, but waiting in airports for planes that are cancelled and <laughs> bags not turning up. and It's a nightmare existence in so many ways, isn't it? There are times when you feel like that, when you sort of you sit there and you wonder what on earth you're doing. But I would... It depends what your definition of insane is, I guess. Like, <laughs> if I was sat in an office, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday... And all I lived for was a holiday twice a year. That would be me going insane. So if you can, I don't know, if you can turn your insanity into something that drives you and makes you want to get up in the morning, then I think that's something worth doing. It's a good old fashioned rationalisation. It? <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. <laughs> <But> that, <does laughs> it? Well, it kind of does, you know. I mean, there's a lot of people who do live week to week, nine to five, and all they do is look forward to Saturday. And they dread Sunday night because that means Monday morning. That's the reality for an awful lot of people. And so I think it pays all of us, and I'm in the same boat, to appreciate what we've got. We're sitting here at 5 o'clock on a beautiful yeah, exactly. afternoon looking out over Bonville Golf Course. I'm calling this work as exactly. you, so. if, if anybody can sit there and say they love what they do for a living, then you can't complain. Yeah, yeah, indeed. What do you see in amateur golfers? And I'm talking pro-am partners, not elite amateurs, amateur golfers. What's a simple thing that us as amateur golfers can do, maybe not even to be better, although that's probably the ultimate way to enjoy the game more, but to enjoy the game more? Is there a pattern of things that you see when you're out there playing with pro-am partners? I think a lot of them beat themselves up a lot. Like We do that as professional golfers, but amateur golfers, I think even more so have higher expectations than they perhaps should and Relative that's not to, to their ability exactly yeah. that's not to you know to beat them up but you know if you if if you could stand there and hit 20 wedge shots in a row how many of them are you realistically going to hit inside 10 foot like we said before and yet they'll hit a wedge shot to 30 foot or just miss a green beat themselves up and then end up taking double and they'll walk to the next tee still you know still swearing away to themselves and you're like you just you know take it easy um it's but that's that's the same at every level yeah. perhaps is professional golf fun that's taking the fun out of it as an amateur <laughs> isn't it as an amateur we take the fun out of it for ourselves a lot of the time by doing that yeah is professional golf fun or can you not afford for it to be fun or is it a different sort of fun perhaps? i think it's a different sort of fun and i think it's a different sort of fun depending on who you talk to like for me i get enjoyment from practice i get enjoyment from working things out I get enjoyment whenever I come off the course and I might have only shot 71, but I hit the ball terrible and I scored really well. Stuff like that, there's a a satisfaction to it. And I think that's where the fun comes for me personally. You know, somebody else might get enjoyment out of even having a social game with their mates or playing a money game on the Tuesday before a tournament starts. I think it's a little bit different for everybody, but... There's there's moments in it, however rare they are, that make it completely worth doing. You're a tournament winner two times. You've won the New South Wales Open. You'll, in fact, be defending for the second time next week. What's that like, to win a golf tournament? I think when you win your first one, it's a massive validation to yourself. Um, 
I've sort of heard you talking about Lucas Herbert a little bit mm-hmm. and Min Woo Lee as well, both won recently. And I feel like before you win for the first time on tour, you're constantly telling yourself that you're capable of doing it mm-hmm. because you know that you can. Mm-hmm. But until you actually do it, there's, there's a tiny part of you that wonders, which, you know, is however much confidence somebody has, you're, you're always trying to justify that confidence to yourself, I think, until you actually win. And then you're like, oh, you know, I can that- do this. I was right, <laughs> yeah. you know. It's a highly improbable scenario, isn't it? 156 players tee up most weeks, or 144. It's an awful lot of other people to beat on any given week, isn't it? <laughs> it is in comparison to other sports, yeah. Um, and I think the other thing that winning has made me realise is you sort of expect that everything has to go well for you to win, but it's not the case. Like You, you will do so much dodgy stuff in the tournaments that you win where you sort of stand there and think, oh my God, like <laughs> how can I justify my living as a professional golfer? <laughs> Like, the first time I won, I had an air shot in that tournament. I wonder if I was going to ask you to tell this story, because I find this intriguing. Yeah, so it was, I don't remember what round it was. It might have been the second round. But there was this one hole I kept it in my drive left every single day. And I was up against a tree root, and I sort of, I looked at it. I think my dad was caddying for me, and he looked at it as well and didn't say anything. But I can kind of sense by his body language <laughs> that he's like, don't, don't do what you're about to do. But I tried to tried to like chip it out or play it back to the fairway hit the tree root miss the ball and you're like wow that's that's just happened (laughs) so then I do what I should have done originally chip it out onto a different fairway Mm -hmm. hit over the trees take my six move on um and you just you know you don't think about stuff like that happening in a tournament that you win and it kind of makes you realize when you go into other tournaments okay, some, I've made a mistake or I've made a double or I've, I've hit some shots that I'm not happy with, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's a four-round tournament. There's, every single player is going to have stuff happen to them. Mm. You've just got to deal with it. What's the key to that? Is that discipline? Were you, and I've heard Stuart Appleby said this once. I've never forgotten it. He said, to win, you've got to get out of your own way. Does that make sense to you? Get out of your own way? Um, I think so, yeah. I suppose golf is a lot about getting out of your own way. Um, but you can look at it slightly differently and say, always go back to what do I know? Like, what do I know about myself? What do I know about me as a golfer? What do I know about what's just happened? And if you can rationalize all of that, then you can focus on the shot in front of you, focus on what's, you know, what you've got to do in that moment. And if, you know, we're all good golfers out here, we're all capable of having birdies and eagles and all the rest of it. So, I mean, last year at the Australian Open, I make a nine on the first hole of the third round. Then had, I don't know, seven birdies or something. And it was the biggest roller coaster of a round I've ever been on. But it just teaches you, like, if you can move on from something that's happened, it doesn't change who you are as a golfer going into the next hole or the next day or whatever. There are five markers in the world, many of them, who would be headless if they made nine on the first hole. And they would shoot from there 82 yeah. almost every time. I think that's that round is one of the proudest I've ever been of myself after I finished. Um, but it was almost like because the shock was so extreme. <laughs> I, like, <laughs> Nine is like, yeah, wow. I, like, I was playing great. <laughs> first first hole of the third round. So How I'm, did you make nine, by the way? Talk us through it. You so probably don't want to remember it. But. <laughs> um, God, I made a couple of nines last year and you like you come off the course and you're like, that's a lot easier to do than you would have thought. Um, it was first hole on the west course at the Grange. There's like a big waist area on the right off the tee. Ah, uh-huh, yeah. Loads of room left. Yep. But I couldn't not hit my drive right for whatever reason. So I went in there and I, I just like, I couldn't get out of the waist area. Right. I was hitting, I was hitting like wedge trying to just so get it up the fairway. So you faffing about in the long grass as well. No, just, just in the sand. In the, oh, right, yeah. okay. Um, and it's, it's really weird because it's, like, it's not like clay, uh-huh. but it's not like a bunker either. So the ball sort of nestles in these little holes and ravines. And eventually I'm stood there thinking, like, I could be in here all day. <laughs> like, at what stage can I just take an unplayable back onto the fairway or something? <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I birdied the next. And I was like, 
I, I turned to whoever I was playing with after I made the birdie and I was like, I promise I won't make a nine on every hole. Like, don't worry. <laughs> Is there an embarrassment there when um, that happens? Th- there can be, especially if if you're playing in one of the last groups mm. or you know the cameras are on you or you know that there's a lot of people watching. You can feel a little bit uncomfortable and, a, you know, God, what must they be thinking? But at the same time, that's where you've got to get back into your, mm-hmm. you know, golf is a game where stuff like that can happen and you've just got to move on to what you know you can do. How long does it take to get used to people watching you? Because for amateurs, that's by far the most terrifying prospect is to stand on the tee of a golf course with a whole bunch of people around watching. Yeah. Um, I think the way I've tried to deal with it is it means that you're doing something right. You know, if you're, especially like out here on the women's tours, there's not going to be people following every single group, every single round. So if there's people watching, then you're in one of the last groups, basically. So you've played well to get... Or you're playing at home. Exactly, yeah, that's true. (laughs) It's family and friends. That's true, yeah. So that's probably a bit more nerve-wracking. But, (laughs) you know, like they're there to see something exciting and entertaining. And if they think that you can provide that for them, then that's quite a cool position to be in, I think. Do you need to be a bit of a show-off to play professional? There was another thing. It was in the same article I read. Um, It was the one... About Mickey Wright, Mickey Wright. Who just the, passed away. The, um, my shot, guy. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's, it is the best column. In yeah, by it's, a long it was brilliant, brilliant that. that. Um, but she said something that I've heard a lot of people say is that as a professional golfer, I think you have to have a tiny bit of that showing off nature to you. There's an element of I know how good I can be, and I know the stuff that I can produce, and I want I want you to see that because you probably can't do that. And it's not in a, I don't think it's an arrogance as such. It's more of a like, if you understand what it takes to pull a shot like that off, then you can appreciate it. Um, But yeah, we've definitely all got a little bit of that. It's why we love Seve, isn't it? And why we love Tiger? Yeah, definitely. You know, they're not afraid of the moment. They want it. They want to be the one who pulls off the magic in that moment. Give give me the ball. Exactly. Are you born with that? Can you learn that? Do you know um, until you get there? <laughs> possibly not, yeah. That's, it's an interesting question, that. Um, maybe you are born with it, I don't know. And the more you get into those situations, the more you realise that you want it. I'd say there are no exceptions that I can think of for players at the absolute top level who have been world number ones who don't have that in them. And maybe that shows that you need it to be there. It can sometimes come across as brashness, I guess, can't it? You think of Norman and well, Patrick Reed's a prime example <laughs> and Phil Mickelson, even in his own way, can be quite off-putting, can't he? But that yeah, is I mean, the confidence you there's, need. There's a lot of players who might rub you the wrong way a little bit and it always used to bug me a bit because I thought maybe that's what you need to be successful and I don't want to be like that. I don't want to piss people off whenever they yeah. come talk to me or I talk about my golf. But I've met a few people over the years who can have like a quieter way of doing it. Who are you thinking of there? Who in particular? Well, Leona Maguire's one. Um, so she was world number one amateur for a long, long time. Um, and all the people that I'd been around in my amateur career had egos, like 100% had egos. And I didn't necessarily like spending that much time with them. Is it because they're told they're going to be the next big thing or maybe they want to believe they're the next? What do you reckon? Maybe. And whenever you're that age, especially, you're trying to separate yourself from all the other amateurs or you've had a junior career where you just you get used to winning. So you do get told, mm. you know. You're, we do it to footballers, don't we? Yeah. Players, and we tell them at the age of 17, 18 that yeah. they're kings. Basically. You do that you often do enough and yeah, they're going to believe it. Um, so, yeah, and I think there's... Sorry, so Leona, you said, was one. Yeah, she's the the best example I can think of right now. The men's game probably has less of them, but Luke Donald, maybe mm-hmm. he got to world number one, and I don't feel like he had quite the brashness of some of the other players who have been there. But then again, he's never won a major, so mm. could argue that's one of the reasons why. I don't know. It's an interesting one. It's hard to know. Well, he's got all the tools, hasn't he, Luke? You, yeah. you wonder, he and Lee Westwood, I suppose, stand out. Man, Montgomery in some ways. Like, how did they not? They've got, I know. they've got everything, you know. Yeah, I mean, if you get to world number one, you've you've got everything you need. That's right. You're so better than you. <laughs> just shows how hard it is to win a golf tournament. As I was going to say, we in the media, we anoint 
young people constantly. He'll win multiple majors, we say. She'll win multiple majors. There are not many of them, are there, <laughs> really? I tell you, that's one, it doesn't irritate me, but I do think there should be a greater understanding of, of how much more there is to do to go from being a young star mm-hmm. to winning multiple majors. Or even multiple tournaments, let's Or be multiple fair. tournaments, yeah. There are so many things that can get in your way, yourself being the biggest one, like mm. we've mentioned before. Um, and majors especially, they're four of them a year in the men's game. There are so many things that have to break your way at those specific moments in the year. And that's why there's so many major winners who haven't necessarily done that much else in the game. Um, you know, even Kepka, he's... You know, he's talked so much about how majors are kind mm. of the thing for him and he doesn't perform anywhere near to that standard in other tournaments. But it will be interesting to see if he actually maintains that over the next few years because Rory did the same thing however many years ago, won so many in a mm. short space of time and then he goes five years without winning one. When you're there and you're winning and you're playing well, it feels easy, it feels natural, it feels like that's the way it is always going to be. be forever, yeah. And then all of a sudden it stops and you can't figure out how, how it's going to change. Yeah. Professional golfers would like golf to look like a, a plane <laughs> taking off, wouldn't they? Yeah. Just a trajectory that goes up. But in reality, it looks like the stock market, doesn't it? It's either <laughs> up or it's down. There exactly. is never an in-between. No. And when it is in-between, you don't enjoy it. No. Because it's, it's boring almost. Bland. And you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I... Like the most not negative but the most sort of meaningless weeks for me have been whenever I've made the cut and then finished 40th or 50th because if I miss a cut as painful as it is I'm desperately trying to figure something out and I'm motivated for the next week and I'm motivated to put things right and if you're contending or you're winning tournaments then that's you know that's the biggest drug of everything because you you just want to keep that going you only need to find the one percent then to get exactly. from third to exactly. first as you're right there you yeah. can taste it so there's yeah that was um out here last year because the way the way i've won the two tournaments i've won have been so different in terms of that line of success that we're talking mm-hmm. about because last year my line looked pretty straightforward you know i went from i missed the cut of the vic open came 20th odd in the Australian Open around 20th here this week top 10 in Canberra the week before I won and then I won yeah it was like this natural progression where every week I was finding those little pieces that Any were going to make could have picked that couldn't they they've got yeah. Liz McLaren she's going the right way I remember Get I remember her. saying to somebody in Canberra my pro-am partners they were making a joke because I think they were accountants or something like that. So they were like, oh, if we ask you who's going to win this week, would it be insider trading? <laughs> and I was like, well, probably. And I was like, but I think I'm going to win soon. Did you? And did you? Did I think that? Yeah, did yeah. you really think that? I, ge- I genuinely thought that, which is whenever I think about it now, it's, it amazes me. But that's how much trust I had in my game at that point in time. Wow. And yet the year before... I remember walking off the course here. So this was only my third tournament of the year. And it's yet, Bonville, by the way. We're at the Bonville, Ladies Classic yeah. this week. So I'd missed, missed the cut at the Vic Open. I wasn't in the Australian Open and I didn't qualify. And then I came here and made the cut. No, Canberra was before this tournament that mm-hmm. year. So I missed the cut in Canberra as well. So I came here, shot... I don't know, three or four or five over in the first round and walked off the course and said to one of my friends, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, I can't keep putting myself through it. I was exhausted mentally from not feeling like I was good enough, you know, because I came out to Australia not feeling ready, not feeling prepared. And I just didn't think I had enough in my game at that point to be competing. And then a week later, I won. (laughs) With like, an air swing. <laughs> it's just, you know, it just blows your mind. It's kind of that once you've let go, maybe. Well, yeah, something maybe. That, maybe it's something that, Maybe yeah. it was the drinks at the Hoey Moey. Well, yeah, probably. <laughs> I think that has a lot might, to answer for, might, actually. <laughs> that uh, that might have helped you along. Who was it? Who who was the enabler that got you addicted on this drug of golf? Who did that to you? It must have been my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, they both play. They're both really good golfers. You did a pro? No. 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 You ran the Stayshore Tour for a while, though, didn't you? My dad did, yeah. 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 Um, so he's worked in golf for right. basically his whole career. And they both play off 
three, four, five. Um, what an annoying family you are for the other members of the bit. club, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that we're all four, my sister as well, all four of our names are on the uh, on the honours boards <laughs> at our club. I think my dad was the last one to get on it, so it was a bit of a running joke for a while. But golf was like a part of my life for kind of as early as I can remember, so... And do you recall, were you one that was hooked on it immediately or you just can never remember a time when it wasn't part of? Yeah, more more that, I think. I, You know, whenever I was younger, I remember not wanting to go to the driving range and stuff. So I don't think I was, I definitely wasn't addicted to it in the way that I am now. But it was just always there. I never had a time where it wasn't part of my life. So I think that teaches you a lot more than you appreciate at the time. So what happened? <laughs> when did I become addicted to yeah, it? When, when, when did it seriously become a matter of, okay, I think I'd like to do this for a living and I think I might be good enough? Um, I think the addiction part came in college because for the first time I couldn't go and play whenever I wanted to. Like, okay, I had school whenever I was younger, but partly because of the weather in England, maybe, I don't know. It wasn't, I was never rushing out to go and practice. Like I enjoyed it. And I played for England and I got into the the kind of the squads, the training squads. And that was probably the first time it became a part of the future mm-hmm. as such. Um, it kind of seemed natural that I would carry on with it. Were you driven at that point by... I, yeah, I was driven. But I was driven by just wanting to get better and wanting to compete with the other players around me. And, you know, it's... It's like a constant mastery thing with golf. There's always something that you're trying to improve, that you're trying to figure out. And I think whenever I got into college, that was when it really became, you know, I want this really badly. Like, I I really want to figure it out. I really want to see how good I can be. And because I was doing, I was studying English and, you know, writing essays left, right and centre, and reading all these books, I didn't have the time for golf that I wanted to have. So whenever I did go to practice or I had a Saturday where I could just spend all day at the golf club, I really appreciated it. And I think that's something that I maybe didn't have before I went to college. So you, you don't know what you've got till it's gone kind exactly, of Exactly, yeah. I wonder whether the tours might learn something from that and give us a break from golf occasionally. <laughs> so we get the chance to miss it. Many have made that, uh, many have made that observation in the past. So you mentioned that you go to college. You're bright. We know you're bright. We've read your blog. We, we know your writing is all sort of good. Is that a hindrance or a help for golf? I think I've asked you this question before, but you can tie yourself in knots, can't you? <laughs> Coming up with complex algorithms in your own mind like, about <laughs> what you need to do to get to the next level. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, it's. I think it's a help for me. I don't think I would be anywhere near as good as I am at golf if my mind didn't work the way that it does. Um but it's being able to use it in the right way and it's being able to recognize when I'm going down the wrong path. But for me, it's almost like I have to do more of that sometimes to get myself out of it because if I turn it into this like emotional state or this, you know, why is this not working? Why why was I not good enough this week? Can I get to where I want to get to? Then I go back to the things that I know and I you know i might i might end up going through every single shot of a tournament until i get to a place where i feel like okay i figured that out and i'm good to go again so it can be exhausting but for me i think it gives me like a different edge to to some other people it's how you do golf it's very personal yeah. golf isn't it yeah and definitely what, what works for you won't work for someone else I remember some Laura Davies might have said you know that what works for her she found what works for her and that was not to practice too much and, and that might be completely wrong for somebody else yeah I mean, you can't copy what she doesn't expect to have i think to be honest success. i think that's the biggest thing i've learned since i turned pro is being okay with doing what works for you mm-hmm. because i might like quite often now i might get to the course on a practice day at seven o'clock in the morning i'll practice for a couple of hours and then i'll leave and I'll go back to my Airbnb or my hotel or whatever, and I'll just chill out for a few hours, and then I'll come back at 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon because I get the most out of it whenever, A, whenever I'm on my own schedule, and B, when it's not crammed with people who are all trying to pull you into this conversation or that conversation. Uh Like, I just want to do my thing 
and and just figure out my things as I go. Are you, rather a, are than, you a headphone? Per? You put the headphones in, which is the message <laughs> to everybody. That I used to be, and then somebody told me um, something about listening to music, not sort of having the effect that you want it to have so I stopped but yeah you don't listen to anything Meg you just put the earphones yeah, in yeah exactly that's all exactly. have nothing playing but it doesn't stop most people you'd be surprised <laughs> I can imagine I can imagine I would imagine when you do that sometimes you get here at seven and you see a particular player and you go home for a couple of hours and you come back and they're still here and then you leave at five and they're still there it could be easy to think I think that's what you're saying is that, oh god I'm not doing as much as them yeah it's it's a difficult balance to find um, because you spend so much of your practice weeks working as hard as you can. You know, it's. I think a lot of people just have that in them as golfers or as sports people. You you want to work hard. You get enjoyment out of working hard. But you have to recognize that at a tournament, working hard might look like only doing an hour of practice and then resting and sometimes that's the hardest thing to do is to recognize when you need to say to yourself, OK, I'm ready. Doing more will only hurt me at this stage. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, that's quite a difficult one because like I enjoy practicing. I enjoy working. I sort of enjoy the, the feeling of being tired from hard work. Uh-huh. But then you get to a Friday afternoon And you need to make one birdie to make sure you're inside the cut line. And you can't think clearly because you're mentally exhausted. Foggy from having done too much. Exactly. Rest is part of it, isn't it? It is. After the body and the the mind and all that stuff. Although I've seen you last week at the Vic Open. I saw a week before at the Vic Open. I saw you on the practice green with the sun going down. They grabbed you for that inside the ropes episode because you were out on the putting green long after everybody had left. (laughs) But see, that's the the same thing. So that was on the Thursday. So I had an early tea time. Played well, didn't putt well, um, had some lunch, spoke to a few people, did my practice, went home. So I got, got back to the Airbnb at three o'clock maybe, did absolutely nothing for three hours. And then I was like, you know what? There's something in my putt in that I want to figure out. I feel good. I feel rested. I'm not out until one o'clock the mm. next day. There'll be nobody on the putting green now. So I went back and then within five minutes I got dragged into a podcast and I was like, great, thanks guys. Something beautiful about a golf course early morning and anything about the light, that, that's a beautiful place yeah. to be whether you're working something out And you know what, you look, you look around and you look at the 18th green and you look at the flags and you sort of picture where all the people are going to be the next day and you just think that's, that's where I want to be. Mm. Like this is, you can, you can picture the moments that you play for, that you practice mm-hmm. for. It's quite spiritual, really. It's a spiritual place to be a golf course, I think, in an early morning or late yeah, evening. Yeah, I light. think so, too. A, it's peaceful. Yeah, and, and as you say, just the flags moving yeah. a little bit in the shadows, especially somewhere like Royal Adelaide. Yeah, the Royal park. Adelaide is a special place. It's, it's really, really quite lovely, isn't it? All right, we've done the golf. We're going to come to the stuff that you probably want to talk about less. <laughs> most people will be familiar with your blog, and most will think, which we'll come to, that all you write about is how women don't get paid as much as men. That's not true, is it? It's, I personally think it's like a long way from the truth. Um, if you actually went back and read every blog that I've written... Which, which is recommended, by the way. Feel free to do, yeah, but do it might take you a while. <laughs> um, it's, I, I don't know how many blogs I've written, maybe 40-odd. I mean, maybe more. I've been doing it since I was in college. There's probably two that I can think of that are directly about... Actually, no, only one that's... 100% about women's golf and the pay gap and equality and all of those things. So what's the rest of it about? We'll come to that one shortly <laughs> because it's the most famous. What's the rest of it about? I know point. because I've been reading well, it. Well, to but. be honest, I don't know. I write and I've got no idea what I'm talking about most of the time. I think it's just... Is it a journal? It's sort of a journal, yeah. But like I've this notebook that I've got here with me, that's probably got more personal stuff in it. But there's quite a lot of... I think like vulnerability in the stuff that I do write. Mm-hmm. So it is, it's personal in that I, I get a lot out of what might be bothering me or. You talk about doubt, don't you? Yeah. Which I think, is fatal for a professional athlete, isn't it? To well, admit that they've, they've got doubt. And- yeah. But I think the way I write, I think a lot of times is whenever I've had doubt and then I figured something out. Um, I'm not so good at writing 
or I don't know, maybe even the process of writing about it helps me figure mm. it out. So I don't necessarily have the answer before I do it. But I also think there's there's so much focus on, you know, you have to be confident as a professional sports person. You have to have this unwavering belief in yourself. Positive self-talk. Yeah. And the reality is there's like 1% of even the elite sports people who actually think like that. So I think on one hand, it I hope that it helps people realize that it's okay to have doubt and it's okay to not sort of have that belief all the time. And then I also think being able to turn your weaknesses into strengths is like a massively beneficial thing. So for me, like... I don't think that showing weakness or showing doubt or showing vulnerability, I don't see that as negative. Like, I think that makes me stronger than people who can't admit that to themselves. Is the writing itself, you sort of touched on, I guess, do, do you enjoy writing? Do you enjoy putting the words on the I do, screen yeah. or the, the key? Yeah. What I, about it do you enjoy? I don't know. I enjoy, I enjoy the feeling of being able to translate something that's been in my mind into a coherent sentence or I don't know if it is coherent, but, you know, because there's so many things that will be like floating around my mind and I can't quite make sense of them. And then I write it and all of a sudden it does make sense. First time? Or are you a you, tinkerer? Um, no, usually I just write and then it's done. I don't tend to come back to things that I've written, but the process of getting it from my mind onto a piece of paper or whatever I think that takes quite a long time in the sense of I might have been thinking about something for two weeks and then I'll write. Um, so just being able to kind of make it concrete, I think that's a bit of a process. But the the feeling you get of actually like putting what you know is a pretty cool sentence together, it's like... Could have showing off, isn't it? Well, kind of, yeah. It's not that different to hitting a three no, iron to 10 foot or, you know, sometimes I'm like, I don't. I don't plan it. It just comes out, and then I look at a sentence, and I'm like, well, "That's really cool." I was like, "Wow, I wrote that. Like, where did that come from?" Um, but I don't know. It's like anything. The more I think, the more you do it, the more you start to understand the process of it. John Huggins said, told a great story. We had him on the podcast a few weeks ago. Told a great story about Dan Jenkins. He passed Dan Jenkins on his way to the press room one day, and Dan was outside having a smoke. He said to, to Dan, "What are you doing, Dan?" Dan said, "I'm writing." <laughs> and it's yeah, true, and it, it is. It is true. It's like with me. If I, if you think about practice for golf, I can be sat here, apparently not doing anything, but it's a form of practice because I'm thinking about golf. I think about golf way too much. <laughs> but like, yeah, I, we get that sense. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's part of it. You don't have to be physically doing what people think the activity is mm -hmm. to be getting better or improving or whatever it might be. Concentrating on a swing position is not the only way to practice exactly. golf. Exactly. Is golf more important than just a game? Yeah. To you? Yeah. It's, I mean, there's a reason why it's such a popular sport with, or there's a reason why people who try it will not give it up that quickly. I think it's, you know, all the cliches of it's probably the most similar sport to life that you have because you've got all the ups and downs you've got the tease that out because there's a lot of cliche in that but i i agree i think it mm -hmm. may, but but put it in the context of a golf hole for us how is it playing <laughs> a par five like life that's a good question um and you made a nine on the first of well, the how is that like life i mean it's it's like life in that you might expect things to go one way and they don't but that doesn't mean you can't get something out of it um it's like life because something really bad happens and how you deal with it is the most important thing. I'd say that's that's probably the biggest thing for me about golf is that it's not necessarily what happens, it's how you deal with what happens and what you do next. Um, you know, and and then you can, if you're talking about a par five, you can talk about going for it in two versus laying up. Like there's not a right way or a wrong way mm. to do things. It's It's knowing what, how you work what's best for you it's understanding yourself and your strengths and your weaknesses to get the best result that you can because to me of course the thing about it is you never know what would have happened if you'd chosen the other mm. the par five is a fantastic example so you choose to go for it and you pull the three wood 
yeah, and whatever even, happens, happens. But you'll never know what would have happened yeah. if you'd hit the eight iron down there to 100 yards. Yeah, that's true. And even going back to – I'm talking about that nine way more than, yeah. that, than <laughs> so I think I something should Something about be. that you need to work out. Um, but even that, like you say, you know, if, if I'd hit that down the left side of the fairway, made five – would I have actually got out of that round uh-huh. the same as what I did? And like the next day I went bogey free, had my first ever hole in one. And it's just like, although, infuriating is what well, it is. Meg. It is infuriating. <laughs> infuriating. Yeah. But, but you know, when, when you're in the moment and those things are happening, you think, God, like I feel terrible. Like if only I'd done this, if only I'd mm. done that. But if you look at it that way, you're possibly not going to learn the thing that, it's it's been put there to make you learn. Mm. We all think we run our lives, don't we? <laughs> we do. We do, we and we're very wrong. I believe think. that we do, don't we? That was what I was going to ask you. Are we right about that? I suppose that depends what you believe about fate and God and kind of deep things like that. But I mean, golf especially. There's so many things that are out of your control that. I think, including how others play. Exactly, yeah. But I think the answer to that question is it's it's not one or the other, I suppose. It's you do what you can do and what you feel is the right thing to do in the moment and you have to accept if that doesn't turn out the way that you want it to. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> like hitting, hitting the drive down the middle of the fairway into a divot or, yeah. or shooting 64 and somebody else shooting 63. Like. That, that's the one I think that intrigues me. Brett Ogle spoke about this years ago. I think it was his, might have been his first or second tournament in America. And the first round he was out early, he shot 65. And he walked off and he said, golf can't be played better than that. It's not possible. <laughs> I've played as well as golf can be. And he went to the shops and did all his stuff and he got there. And Davis Love shot 63. And he said, well, what can you say? Exactly. Golf can't be played any better than that unless you do two shots better. Yeah. Like that's he did I, that's where off. I think golf is great because it's so humbling like that. You can never... You can never believe the hype that you want to tell yourself because somebody else will go out there and do something better. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that's kind of what I love about it is that, like, I wouldn't enjoy golf if every tournament was one round. Like, I enjoy, I enjoy the the difference that comes on a day to day basis and even a hole to hole basis and how you might wake up one day and feel completely different to how you felt the day before, or you might go out and have the best warm-up of your life and then you make a nine down the first <laughs> like it's it's the not knowing what's going to happen and having to deal with it that i think is one of the best things about it the opposite of that's not uncommon is it how many players have you heard say it was the worst practice i shanked the last that's, ball i hit before yeah, i went to the first that's team. the expectation thing again maybe yeah you, well, well, you believe your own hype and then yeah. you're you're in trouble yeah indeed back to the writing so you tackle all sorts of really interesting and very deep sort of cerebral and esoteric stuff about golf which I think is about more than golf and it's it, it really is that trying to work out life but then you write that one blog about the gender pay difference yeah were you surprised by what's happened since then unfairly you've become known as the poster girl for campaigning for equity of pay rightly or wrongly yeah. between men and women in golf how does it look from your side I can only see from outside. What's it look like from your side? Um, I, there's a few things there. I'd say there's a bunch of things. <laughs> first of all, I would rather I was the spokesperson or whatever you want to call it than nobody was. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not I want that position is different. You'd rather somebody else ideally do it, well, but if they're I not mean, going to, I feel like. Well, I I still I don't know enough, and I feel like that's the that's the dangerous part for me is that there's a lot of things that I want to be able to answer and I want to be able to talk about and write about, but I don't have the information to feel like I can do that in a way that's, that's okay. Um, whereas a lot of people perhaps think the opposite and will throw things at you with no facts or justification. Doesn't stop lots of people on social media. Exactly. The, the thing I find interesting is I wrote a blog about the whole gender pay gap, um, a couple of years ago. And it got, you know, got a fair bit of traction. It got some responses, had, you know, had some arguments with people and had some... I think you ended know. up on our podcast, did you not? I think, was that after that first one, maybe? Possibly. I in touch with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. But then, you know, and then it sort of disappears and nothing really happens. What, what did spark that? Was that the one about the tournament in the Middle East? 
one the week after the other. Yeah. Oh, that was uh, a, oh, that, no, that was a tweet, wasn't it? That was just yeah, a so tweet. Yeah, so that's what I was getting to. So right. I wrote this blog where, and it, I probably shouldn't have written it because I was trying to play tournaments at the time and it was all I could think about. I was like, oh, if I could find out that piece of information or if I could research this, then that will really make this point stand out. There's a journal in there, unfortunately, mm, for you. Maybe. Um, <laughs> You know, so I spent quite a lot of time trying to make sure that I was justifying things properly and correctly and factually. And then it sort of dies down and that's fine. The world carries on. And then, like, I don't know, nine months later, I tweet something that's just got two prize funds in it. So it's got two numbers in it and, like, a sentence explaining what I was talking about. And that, in in the context of my twitter or my or the sort of golf world that we're in that like blew things up completely and it like that sort of irritates me in one sense because i wasn't really explaining myself i wasn't justifying the reasons why those numbers were the way that they were but because it was such a shocking difference well well, i can't remember what the disparity was crazy wasn't it It was was, yeah it was abu dhabi abu dhabi because we played one week prize fund of it was 200 and something Mm -hmm. thousand dollars and then the men play the next week and it's a rolex event so it's seven million dollars and like there's you know there's tons of times where we might think about the difference in the pay gap and as female golfers we're like god you know this is how much they're playing for this week that's crazy but that one in particular so 40 times nearly yeah Almost 40 that, times as much that just made me feel a little bit sick because the course was 10 minutes away from where we were playing it was the week after where we were when we were playing and for it to be that different like it just you know because well it says two things doesn't it if you want to be positive about it, it says well not positive about it it says that the guys are worth this much more but what it actually says is Women are only worth that exactly percentage. There's no yeah. way around that. Exactly, I and that common sense says that makes any sense. Exactly, like you know, I'll get into discussions with people, or the constant argument put back to me is that you know it's a it's a marketing thing, or it's an economics thing, it's a supply and demand thing. More people watch. Yeah, more people watch mm-hmm. all the rest of it, and I like I get that, and I agree with that. Like I'm not, I have never written or said or you know done anything to say women should be paid as it stands women should be paid the same as men for playing professional golf because those factors are important but when you sit there and you say this means that you're telling me that the number five ranked female golfer in Europe or in America is worth five percent one fortieth one fortieth of the equivalent male like that that to me just isn't right you know there there probably is a difference in who's the better golfer but even that you can take so much further back than people realize because if you've if you've got sponsorship coming in left right and center or if you've got tournaments to play every week rather than every four weeks or every five weeks and if you can pay for your coach to be out there with you like who's going to become the better player in the end and that i feel like that's the side of it that people don't really think about you know they don't care about it though do they meg isn't that the well, truth of it no they really don't care and you know what? whenever i first tweeted about it i so i tweeted those prize funds in abu dhabi and then a few days later i tweeted a thread because i wanted to kind of explain myself a little bit further and that's kind of what i said i was like if if a journalist went and brought that fact to the attention of a male professional golfer, what would they say? What would they think? They probably wouldn't care, no. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't even cross their conscience to, to think about it. But if somebody actually put that to them, you know, would it make them think a little bit? They say, yeah. If they had, if their wife was playing on tour or their sister or their daughter... I think the daughters then would are the they key. think it's okay? Yeah. Daughters are the key to me, <laughs> I, I th- and I mean that quite seriously. I think daughters change things for yeah. for dads. They suddenly yeah. see a world that they've never seen before. Yeah. Because we're not women. We don't 
Little I bit think like when, that's same where, as we're not Asian or black yeah, or exactly. You cannot see that world if yeah. you don't live in it. And that's where I think my dad personally has been really good at talking about this issue or understanding this issue because he understands that while he might not agree with me about all of it, he understands that I'm the one that's in that situation. I'm the one that's you know that sees it from the context of being in it. And therefore, how I view that is different to how he views it. Like, I I don't think that male professional golfers and the media respect female golfers in the same way. And from from the outside, somebody else might not see that, might not think that, but they're not in, they don't sort of experience it. So Walk a mile. Exactly. Like you said, it's the same way we can't, we can try and talk about and understand the issues that other people face, but unless you're the one that's in it, you can't you can't feel how it feels. Hmm. I wonder ultimately where it goes, Meg. You're, it feels to me like you're at this. It's not a crossroads, but you're kind of torn. You want to be the best golfer you can be, hmm. but whether you like it or not, you've kind of been lumped with this other responsibility <laughs> of being that spokesperson. Yes. It's something I've sort of struggled with on and off over the last couple of years or last year. Um, Like I'd way rather write about golf and about the highs and lows that golf brings than about the pay gap. Like, which is really gender politics, isn't it? It's it's actually much bigger than the pay gap in men's and women's golf. It's about much deeper issues about how we deal with each other as people. Yeah, and like I said before, that's not something that I have anywhere near as much information about as I do about professional golf as a professional golfer so it doesn't you know it doesn't sort of stimulate me as much but at the same time it's an issue that's worth talking about and worth thinking about and worth trying to make better and if if I'm in a position where I can do that a little bit then I think I've got a responsibility to do it and that's kind of the way I've started to look at it is okay I'm not gonna I'm not gonna affect my performance as a professional golfer by being a good person or by doing what I think is the right thing you know I'll always feel more comfortable doing the things that I believe in than than letting something slide better to die on your feet than live on your knees and some of those something like that yeah sort of big concepts have you been surprised by some of the vitriol yeah um it's it does amaze me that people can say stuff that's so personal about somebody that they don't know um for, for, for reasons that are at best questionable you've had a, you, you don't agree on something financial exactly um it's not like i've gone out and attacked anybody's you know way of living or you know all the rest of it but i think people are afraid of change i suppose um why that is i don't know but are you afraid of change um, I suppose I, I, am. I, I suppose we all are. I reckon I am. <laughs> I, yeah, I think so, but that doesn't mean it's a bad thing no, either. No. Um, in fact, when it's forced on you, it's often your best times in life. Well, exactly. You're forced to do something you didn't want to. It's like, yeah. oh, actually, that was really good. I'm exactly. glad we did that. Um, but I mean, what you know, the stuff that I've had is nothing in comparison to what what other people I know or other people that have stood up for issues that are bigger than this. You know, it's it's nothing in the context of that. But it's still, as somebody who like doesn't like confrontation and and tries to, you know, be balanced and reasonable most of the time, it can be quite shocking to have somebody be like, you know, call you names or all the rest of it. You got a folder on your phone. It's got <laughs> screenshots of some of this stuff. I do, yeah. And do you look at it often? No, I. I think whenever can I, I look was, at it? of course you can. Yeah. <laughs> whenever I was um, sort of in the middle of this stuff happening. It, it got to me a lot more because, you know, you get comment after comment after comment and you'd start to think, A, am I wrong? Have I said something that's just, you know, that just isn't justifiable? Um, and B, is it worth it? That's the biggest thing, you know, because if, if it makes me angry or if it makes me upset or if I go to bed and I'm thinking about it, is that really a good thing, you know? But I think I'm I'm learning to to know when to put myself out there and when to put these opinions out there and when to read through every single comment and when not to. Um, so, 
I'm gonna, I want to have a look at some okay. of these comments. I might read some of them out so people can understand just what it is. But then I want to get your thoughts on maybe some of the other feedback you've had from other players and maybe some of the the good stuff. But I think it's important to for people to know just some keep, of the things. Keep scrolling. Just keep, keep scrolling. More people watch men's golf. Hang on. What is this one saying? Who is Megan McLaren? <laughs> Is this what we do now? Make a fuss of things till we get our way. Take it up with your fans. Most people weren't told no as kids, and it shows. <laughs> Stuff a, like that's not, not great, yeah. Simple economics. There's probably quite a few that say simple economics. I'm not seeing any more now. Oh, God. <laughs> I found the other screen. Get more Instagram followers. They'll toss your gear whenever you want. I'll toss your gear whenever you want. Good Lord. Why should they sponsor you? Because you're a girl? No. Another female in sports complaining that men's sports bring in more viewers and revenue. The common theme I see here is, as far as I can tell, nobody's put their name on any of that. No. People are very brave whenever they know that you can't. They're anonymous. Yeah. Has your dad seen some of these? Yeah, he, that must be a bit he'll confronting. occasionally engage with people. Um, but I think he knows that, you know, you know how the world works. You know that if you, you know, what's that line about if you've got enemies or if you've got people that disagree with you, at least it means you've stood up for something. <laughs> you've, at least you know? you've done, um, you've done, uh, done something. What about the good stuff? What about other players? What's been their reaction? Why don't you try and qualify for the Open then? Mouthpiece. Too hard, too long. Thought so. Now F up and give it a rest. You will never earn as much as the men, so stop your effing bleating. Jack, is that Jack Laffey? Well done, Jack. You should be (laughs) proud of yourself, mate. Do you kiss your mother with those lips? (laughs) I Um, imagine there's plenty of those. Yeah, there's a few. But yeah, actually, I do, I get far more positivity than all of that stuff that you see there. How does that reveal itself? Do players openly come up to you and say, this is fantastic, or do they say to you on the side, I really like that thing that you wrote, but don't tell anybody because I don't want to get what you get on Twitter. (laughs) A bit of both, yeah. Um, Even today, I was walking past the putting green and one of the caddies grabbed me and was like, oh, um, by the way, I really enjoy the stuff that you write and I think it's good on you for not going to Saudi Arabia as well. So I think whenever you get little comments like that it kind of just validates things for you a little bit um because obviously i always do the thing that i think is right or Mm. i write things because i enjoy writing and you know it's just something for me to get off my mind but you know it's like anything when you get told like oh i agree with you or i support you or i think what you do is cool you know it just it it gives you an incentive to keep doing it and I think that's what's happened more so over the past year is I've had more support, so it's made me want to keep going. If you look at it the right way, do you value the support more than the value you put on the... Yeah, the, the, I do. The negative. Because I know those people. Yeah. I know the people who are supporting me and I respect their opinions far more than people that I don't know who probably just spend all their time criticizing other people on social media but you know the the moment where it stood out to me the most was the tournament in jordan whenever we played against the men so it was, it was the week of the masters wasn't it last year or the week um, after or the or week before before, before maybe it wasn't it was, televised which was just no awful. it was so they had the it was the jordan mixed open so it was us the challenge tour and the senior tour and then they had the augusta women's National amateur women, right, tournament yeah, yeah. And it was the A&A as well. At the same well. time, yeah. So I remember writing something before the week started, just saying, you know, I can see how this is going <laughs> to go. Get, it's like, going to get lost, but... Yeah, like, people are going to just compare it to the men. Like, we're going to play against the men, and people are going to say, well, you know, either you're playing off forward tees, or the men are better than you because the scores show that. And then the women were going to play Augusta and people were going to say they're not playing the course as well as the men play it. So there was going to be all this. So I just said, you know, I hope that we can just appreciate what the female golfers are doing for themselves rather than have to compare it to what the men do 
you know, because that's what's great about golf is that you can just appreciate good golf no matter who's playing mm. it. Um, so anyway, so I wrote that and then the tournament got underway and I played like some of the best golf of my life. Should have won the tournament. One of the hardest losses <laughs> that I've ever felt. But the support that I got from the players during that week and after that week. The male it, players, the women? Or the women. No. Um, the and women and the some field. of the men as well. Uh-huh. But yeah, the support I got from the players in the field and people on social media back home and journalists and all the rest of it, it honestly blew me away. And it was, it was probably that more than any other moment that made me think all of this is worth doing. Because whether people show me it or not, as it happens the support that they showed me then was like, okay, people see it and they appreciate it, whether they say so or not. Do any disagree with you? Any of your fellow players come up and said to you, stop um, it, you're making my life harder than it needs <laughs> they to haven't. be? They might, they might think that, but nobody said it to me. Um, I think, I think most of the players appreciate... Um, Surely they must all realize well you're all in the same boat well exactly yeah there's, there's golfers on the let who have jobs yeah um because they've and got things, enough golf to support you know, as a professional just because i'm the one who like writes about it or talks about it that doesn't mean i'm the only one that ever thinks it or or says it you know there's you could go up and ask any player here what do you think about this and they'd probably say something similar to what i say but you know you the more you talk about it, the more you are the one who gets asked yeah. about it. Um, so, And you're good at talking about it, which helps. You're good at writing about it, which helps. You, you, you put the message in a way that's understandable. So that all helps. I want to talk to you about Saudi Arabia okay. and what happened there because uh, we know there's issues. that The men's European tour has been going to Saudi Arabia for a couple of years and the top players have copped a pasting on social media. In fairness, it's probably, yeah, <laughs> that's about as fair as it gets. I mean, Phil Mickelson got thrown under the bus by plenty, as did Brooks Kepka, Dustin Johnson, Justin Rose, all of those guys who kind of played there. Announcement not long ago there'd be a women's event in Saudi Arabia, which I'm sure the irony of that is not lost on a lot of people for a, yeah. a place that we know has a human rights record, particularly in relation to women, which is not enviable. And all of a sudden it emerged that you wouldn't be playing. Now, how did that... There's two ways that can happen. One is for you to come out and announce it to make a stand. The other is how it actually happened. Yeah. Tell us what actually happened. I mean, I decided I'd, I'd been thinking about it from the moment that the men's tournament got announced because I was like, God, if we were in that position, what would I do? What would I do? And then a year later or two years later, we are in that position. Um, not the $2 million appearance. For well, you. no, not that. I doubt that would change your mind. I you hope can't, it wouldn't. You can't know until it's shown to you, can you? No. Um, so anyway, so I kind of went back and forth in my head for quite a few weeks, especially after we sort of had the confirmation that the event was going to happen. And then eventually it like hit me pretty clearly that I wasn't going to go. And once, once I kind of realized that in my mind, I was, I felt, I felt a lot freer about it because I was like, that's my decision made. I think it's the right decision for me personally. Is it a comment on anybody else? That's that. No, not at all. And I'll get to that in a sec, but, and then I went back and forth between, do I, make a statement about this do I announce it publicly or do I just quietly not show up and eventually I decided that I would quietly not show up because I didn't feel like it was the right thing to do to put other people in the position of having to say well this is why I'm going Mm -hmm. um which is inevitable isn't it if someone says they're not everyone who is going gets asked well she's not why are you exactly and maybe because of some of the the sort of arguments that I've been dragged into with the kind of gender pay gap stuff. Jack and Laffey and his mates. Exactly. I knew what would happen and I felt like this was far bigger of an issue than something that I can explain myself. I don't have enough facts. Um, but then obviously quite a few journalists asked me about it so I, I kind of gave, gave my reasons and left it at that and tried not to engage with too many people (laughs) on social media afterwards. And what has been the response? Because this is one that might upset some of your fellow players. Yeah. um, And obviously I've got a lot of friends who are going. Who will play. Yeah. We spoke to Flick Johnson a couple of weeks ago at the Vic Open, and she's going. Yeah. And I I understand 
why the majority of them would go. The men less so. Uh, but the top men. The top men. Yeah. The, below the, the top ones, there's a level of understanding of because the world ranking points. Like this is Money, your you career. Know, it's your job. You've exactly. got to pay mortgages and school yeah. fees. And, and like some of the girls have said, you know, it could be the difference between keeping your card sure. and not keeping your card at the end of the year. And that's a hard thing to, to turn down. Um, but a couple of the comments I had on social media were quite amusing because I had, I had one person who was, it bothers me when there's somebody who is in golf and who is doing the same thing as me for a living when they make comments like this because he said, you bang on about playing for more money and then there's a $1 million event and you don't go. And I was like, if there was ever a way to miss the point of both arguments... Mm you know you've you've done it um that sort of simplistic exactly. binary view of the world is common though isn't it and these tend to be the the bulk of the arguments so the question here is of course and this is this is the great conundrum of Saudi Arabia and suddenly the, you know we see the sports washing stories that yeah. this is what they're trying to do is buy buy some sort of prestige yeah. with big events so if you don't go to Saudi Arabia do you Where do you China? draw the line? Where's the line? Yeah. We, we, you don't have to look far in Australia to find pictures of no. children behind barbed wire. No. And this, this is the thing. If you tried to live by that moral standard, you probably wouldn't play a tournament in any country in the world. You might not eat. <laughs> you, you probably wouldn't not eat. eat. You certainly You're wouldn't right. wear clothes. And, but I like the way Huggy put it um, whenever he's talked about it. He's sort of said, I don't necessarily know where my line is, but I know that Saudi Arabia is beyond that line and that's kind of how I feel about it as well um, and obviously the difference with Saudi is that a lot of the comments about what it's being used to do are that it's being used to cover up the things that go on there on a day to day basis whereas I'm not sure you can say that about every other tournament that we play regardless of what country it's in you know it's a, spa- a state sponsored event but you can you can make the other argument and say if one Saudi girl is taken along to that tournament and sees sees people who look somewhat like her, you know, then maybe it will inspire her. So not to go and play golf necessarily, but to understand that women can actually yeah, women can do things do things in society. Women can what have they their are. own profession. Mm. Is it real and important that can't see it, can't be it? I've been intrigued by it yeah. ever since I heard it for the first time because I'm a bloke <laughs> just <laughs> maybe a year ago. And I've been intrigued by the notion ever since. I absolutely love that motto because whenever I talk about this issue and people are like simple economics or the rest of it, they don't. I don't think people quite comprehend what it's like to have society constantly reinforce that only men can do a certain thing or at least to a lot greater extent than women can if you if you go and pick up a golf magazine if you if you're a young girl and you walk into a shop and you pick up a golf magazine for the first time i mean it's probably not going to happen but if they did hey and you, that's my job <laughs> <laughs> easy <laughs> we've um, all got our problems but you know if they're if they're trying to pick a sport to play mm-hmm. and they flick through this magazine that's got 200 images of golfers in it and not a single one is of a woman are they really going to think oh this could be a career for me like and that's true that you haven't picked that out of the air have you i haven't that is, no, a, that that's, is a real a, that's a real thing that, thing that you've done yeah you've picked up a magazine counted the photos well somebody else has done it for yeah. me and told me but yeah wow. um and like that i feel like the media especially have a far bigger responsibility than they realize. And I don't think it's just a case of entitlement as a female. I think it's a case of, it's a case of fairness. Like, you know, we've lived in this world for so long and like opportunities are changing all the time. And we're obviously in a far greater place than we were a hundred years ago or 50 years ago or 20 years ago, but there still shouldn't, we still shouldn't have to live in a world where a guy and a girl could stand there and one of them has the option to do something and one of them doesn't based on their gender and it is based on their gender. 
these are complex and very big <laughs> issues and yeah. questions, aren't they? To me, the people who get it wrong, for want of a better term, are those who think that it's simple. Yeah. It's the simplistic yeah. responses that are the most infuriating because you don't pretend to know everything. No, and that's why I find it hard on social media to talk about because I could, you know, I can't do it in a tweet. I can't do it in a blog. A, because I get don't... Get better. Just be better. Can't <laughs> well, you just yeah. get better? Exactly. Be better. There's your answer. Yeah. That's what men do. <laughs> Or go and play the same tour as them. Go yeah, and try and you, qualify for yeah, the same tournament. If you're good enough. But, you know, like I talked about the other week at the Vic Open, if you if you said to a fan, okay, you're going to go watch this group and tomorrow you're going to go watch this group, one was a male group and one was a female group, I don't think they would come away and necessarily say that they preferred watching the male group. They might but it would be for different reasons well, that's the reality, than they, the fact that it was a guy. They watching both for exactly. different reasons. Yeah. Both would have something to offer. And I think when you, if you want to make it simple, if you put that argument to somebody, but the problem is you'd have to put them in the situation. You can't just say it to them because they would just tell you, no, you're wrong. But if you did that to somebody, then I think they would get it. And like, isn't that what it all all boils down to is golf is a game of entertainment and you can be equally as entertained by watching a male play golf as by a female play golf. Because the reality of it is you only have to look at the highlight reels at the end of the year from all the men's tours and the top 10 shots, I will guarantee you there may be one drive. Drive. Maybe. Yeah. If it's been super special and Dustin Johnson's driven. The rest will be pitches, chips and irons. Yeah. And well, if, it was, if it was purely about power, again, it's a simple argument, all people would do is watch long drive watch long competitions. Drive. That's right. And they don't because it's golf and golf is like incredible. It's multifaceted, you know, which is yeah. the appeal, isn't it? The 300 yard drive and the one foot putt count for exactly, exactly. the same. And that's enough to drive you absolutely <laughs> nuts. On the Vic Open, a couple of things to finish. On the Vic Open, uh, hugely important symbolically, obviously, hasn't drawn the top LPGA players in the numbers we'd hoped in the first two years. Is that something we should be concerned about? I would say it, it possibly should have been something to be concerned about last year. But I think without knowing the numbers to prove it, I'm pretty certain that the field was a lot stronger this year mm-hmm. than it was last year. You had however many major winners there. Mm, 15 or something. Yeah, crazy, which is yeah. probably parks, more than so that you'd get at a, a normal tournament. <laughs> um it's it's hard it's a hard one with the Vic Open because I remember reading last year like one of the great things about the Vic Open is the the intimacy intimacy of it the no ropes yeah and the better players that you get and the bigger star power that you draw the harder that will be to keep but I think is it worth giving up no it's not but it's um I would like to think more of the female players would realize the opportunity that is there in that it's okay we're putting men and women on equal footing so let's go and be a part of that and let's show what we can do but the problem is we're all sports people we're all athletes this is our career and people do what's best for their career people don't tend to think about the bigger picture that much and there's scheduling issues and time in planes and all the other stuff that goes into a decision yeah to uh, to make. And of course the irony of the Vic Open is that the women's tournament has been the stronger of the two. Here we go with comparisons. Yeah. <laughs> you can't help it obviously. The yeah. two fields, oh which one's the stronger? The women's has been the stronger and for the four or five that I've been to, the more entertaining <laughs> generally. You said that not me. Yeah, Let's just right. get that, that clear. <laughs> that, that has been the truth of it for most years because you've got the more compelling names. Better yeah. known players. That yeah. You know them for a reason. The reason is because they've got a higher profile because they've been winning whatever. Um, On a side note, is Jeff Ogilvie our favourite golfer as women? He seems to have got a lot of support on (laughs) social media, but he's talked, I think, very sensibly and eloquently about the Vic Open, and it feels like he's kind of had his eyes opened a little bit to something he didn't know existed because he's been a top 10 player in the world much of his life. And I think, you know, maybe that's the way we have to go about it is just try and open one person's eyes Mm -hmm. at a time. And thankfully in somebody like Jeff, you've got, somebody who can talk about it 
with intelligence and with reason and rationale. Um, with gravitas. He's one of USO. Exactly. You, 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 His no, voice means something. That's right. Nobody is – Jack Laffey is not going to start <laughs> throwing tweets at him that exactly. tell him to F, shut the F up. And, and like whenever, you know, there was a few little snippets from, from conversations with, with him during the Vic Open and – my social media especially was just full of players, of female players yeah. quoting it and, mm. and, you know, thanking him and saying, everybody listen to Jeff because we appreciate how important that is mm. because it's not something that we've had before. And I think that's like what we were talking about before. A lot of the male golfers just don't care because not, and that's not to have anything against them, but it doesn't affect them. No, there's no malice, is there? No, there's no malice at all. It's just not something that enters their thoughts because they've got their careers and they've got things that they're not happy with. But whenever we have somebody as female golfers who can speak for us a little bit, who has that kind of standing with mm. fans, especially, you know, it just, it makes our message louder, I yeah. think. In a funny way, it's kind of a bit disappointing that it takes that yeah. too, isn't it? That, it is. that says something that, oh, Jeff said it, so now it's all suddenly and that, you know, yeah. all these players have to go pandering and say what a terrific bloke Jeff is. I mean, really, Jeff's just said what he should yeah. say exactly. as, a, and that's as what, a bloke, not a US Open I champion. think I tweeted that at some point that week is to say he's – and it's the same with me. I get told that I'm controversial and I'm like, am I, am I really though? Like if you look at everything that I've said, a lot of the time I don't actually – take a stance on something because I see both sides like I try to be as balanced as I can but because you're saying something that goes against the grain that that upsets you know what is currently done people are like oh you know are you sure you should say that yeah shrill exactly bleating bleating um but it's it's like the tennis thing with Andy Murray he's probably woman's tennis is biggest proponent Mm -hmm. and because of his standing people pay attention and that's going to be the reality for a while I think is it's going to take men standing up for women for women to be able to to have the place that they deserve yeah it kind of dawned on me this year we're still banging on about this men and women thing at the Vic Open and every press conference every player has to ask about it and they've kind of got a fawn at the altar of (laughs) When in reality, what we've got here is, is a golf tournament or two golf tournaments. Let's get on with yeah, the golf. just come and enjoy it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it doesn't it's, have to be this big political statement. No. It just it is was at what first, it is. But now it, it yeah. should have kind of drifted. We shouldn't be paying it yeah. as much attention as we do. Last one, maybe. <laughs> what does the ideal golf world look like to Meg McLaren? <sighs> and this is the one that might get you in trouble. <laughs> Just, Might have to ask Jack Laffey. If, if, if Jack Laffey hears this, he'll be all over it. But seriously, what what would it look like? Because I, I know it's a mul- it's like a hairball. You start pulling yeah. bits out, and it's it's a multifaceted problem. But if we're- if we're talking about men and women, I think ideally there's still separate tours. The the men still play on their tours, and the women still play on their tours, but they have equal media exposure. They have, in an ideal world, equal pay because there will be I. You know, people might disagree with me here and I would be happy to be proven wrong on this, but I think that there would be as much interest in female golf as men's golf. Like I I just think there would be because it's golf. If what? If we told women's stories more and better the way we do with men? If if you right now took everything that exists in the world of men's golf and put it into female golf and that's television production that's media exposure that's you know if you if you brought magazine all pictures. the sa- <laughs> magazine <laughs> pictures if you brought all the fans from a men's event to a women's event and just said spend your day there then i i genuinely believe there would be a similar level of interest maybe there wouldn't but until that all happens we won't know that we and know that it would, though, wouldn't we? Because we've got South Korea and Japan that exactly. tells us. Yeah, just, That's the thing. If you pump more money and more resources into one side of it, that side will become better. That's why there's so many better South Korean female players than there are male players. And, and in South Korea, golf is women's golf on television is 10 times more popular, apparently, than men's yeah, golf. That's exactly. what the actual rate so, is. I mean, effectively, are. that proves our argument right there, yeah. the end. But... I would love to have 
a few tournaments where the men and women are alongside each other, like the Vic Open or... This new one, the Annika and Henrik thing, Sweden, concerns yeah. me a little bit in as much as <laughs> to play for the same purse but essentially a handicapped event. I feel like that's – there's in, something not golfy about it. Yeah, and some – and this is what I talked about before the Jordan event is that it almost feels like a lose-lose yeah. in in a certain way because – If you'd won Jordan, you won off the forward tees. If, yeah, if I won Jordan, I didn't deserve it because I wasn't playing off the same tees as the men. If a guy wins or if a guy gets beaten by a girl, then it's like, oh, you got beaten by a girl. And I don't know how good that is for the game. But having said that, if you can make people accept the argument that women and men shouldn't play off the same tees, which is, I don't know, that's a but pretty... It's fraught too, isn't it? It we is. We know there's some women professionals exactly. hit it further than some male professionals. Exactly. I mean. But the way, you know, the way yardages are worked out and the way course setups are determined is by the averages of however far everybody hits it. They got it bang on, didn't they, in Jordan? They Somehow. Did. Mathematically, Somehow they, they got did. it bang on. And all credit to them for how much work went yeah. into that. I have no idea if that's going to work in Sweden or not because it's so complicated. Mm. And it, I think it's very dependent on the style of course that you're playing. But if it does work, I think it's a brilliant spectacle because like in Jordan, you've got me, a female player, You've got a challenge tour player and you've got a senior tour player all playing in the last group, yeah. all with a chance to win. Like, That's how cool is that? How are they with you? How, are the, good. how are the guys? Yeah. yeah, really good. I think. It, Was it confronting for some of them, do you think? Maybe, but I think a little bit like how you said the Vic Open people bang on about how it's putting men and women together and can't we just get on with it? I feel like that's a little bit how it was for the players uh-huh. in that it's like, we're just here to play a golf tournament and, you know, everybody does things their own way. I've got to play. I don't care about yeah, that. I've got it's to play. not like every girl has never spoken to a guy before. Yeah. Like, but I think, I think if you're aware, it's, it was interesting. It's interesting to see how they played certain holes depending on where their tee was, depending on where the flag was. It's interesting to compare short games and, you know, I am play and all the rest of it. And there was a couple of tees. I remember one par three. It must have been a practice day. But we all walked off the tee and the guys were like, what club did you hit there? And we'd hit the same club and we were like, God, that's a hard green to hit with a four iron. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it's interesting in that regard. Yeah. But, you know, we're all golfers. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? I, I feel like the model... If you want to, if, the, if you want to do something for gender in golf, the Vic, Vic Open model is the right one yeah. for me. It's two I'd separate tournaments, same purse, so the same value, yeah. and field plays against field. Yeah, and then, exactly. To me, that that works, and I think we've proven it works. It's, it's been a great spectacle every year. Meg, I could talk to you for hours. I won't. It's just been <laughs> fabulous to talk to you. What about your own golf? Last one to finish oh, up. God, that's a big question. Um, I feel I feel really good about my golf. Obviously, I've missed a couple of cuts, but. There's always something in golf that, you know, might be an obstacle or might get in your way. But just looking around here and playing practice around here at Bonville, I feel completely different to the player that I was a year ago. And a year ago, I felt completely different to the player I was a year before that. So that to me shows that I'm doing something right. And whatever happens after that happens. Oh, I'm torn because I want you to be the best golfer you can be and have all the success (laughs) in the world. But... I really want you to come and join us and be a writer and a speaker on stuff that's really important and way bigger than golf as well. But do maybe the golf I can first. do both. Well, you might be. You become the Jeff Ogilvie once you've won the U.S. If Open. If I win the U.S. Open, the I'll take that. Platform is bigger and uh, yeah. trying for America again this year. Heartbreaking, I know. Last year you did that podcast with Garrett Morrison, which was fantastic. The little He's sort a of good audio guy, documentary. Yeah. Yeah. He kept pushing me on some of those questions that I did not want to answer. But <laughs> that's what journos do. Yeah, good ones, not me. Good <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Meg. And best of luck this week. Thank you, Rod. Pleasure. Well, since that chat, of course, the world's changed completely with the postponement or cancellation of virtually all professional golf worldwide. Hopefully, one of the upsides of that might be some more musings from Meg on her blog, which I really can't recommend enough. You'll find it at www.megmclaren.com. That's M-E-G-M-A-C-L-A-R-E-N, megmclaren.com. And you can also follow Meg on Twitter at at Meg underscore McLaren, McLaren spelt the same way. That's it for episode 14, but I hope you can come back in a couple of weeks for episode 15 
when we'll get the chance to talk all things golf architecture with one of the very best in the business. So who's going to do something different? I feel like I am because I'm in, I'm in the position to do it. You know, I have the luxury of kind of trying to do some different things and I feel like I have the responsibility to do it. That's Tom Doak next time on The Thing About Golf. 